Hi, I'm Bernard Sheridan. Welcome to our channel. And today we're going to take a look at a video interview of our podcast, Breaking Par, with Brian Jacobs of Brian Jacobs Golf. Brian is involved with eyeline putting. And uh, I don't know whether you ever heard of the eyeline golf company. I'm sure you have. If you're interested in golf, I'm sure you have heard about that. They have some awesome training aids. Brian's going to give us a little bit of insight on that and on the insight of his instruction in this interview, and I know that you'll enjoy it. So as always, thanks for being with us. Try to keep it in the short grass, and here's our interview with Brian Jacobs. Brian, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. So um, we met recently, uh, finally in person, uh, right. down at the PGA show. How, how did you like the PGA show this year? And I know that you were at the eyeline putting booth for, for quite a good bit of that. But, um, when you got away from there, uh, how did, how did you like the PGA show this year? I liked it. I actually like it a lot. Um, early in my career, I didn't have a lot of interest really in going to it. And then, uh, got involved with eyeline a number of years ago and, and they had invited me down a number of years and finally took them up on it. Well, I enjoy it a lot. I get a chance to see a lot of people, meet a lot of people. I love people. So it's interesting to watch them and see the product and see what's new and what's happening and, and kind of connect with people that, that maybe you haven't met face to face just like yourself. So it's it's really cool to put uh, kind of a Facebook or a Twitter or an Instagram uh, name and a face together and, and see all the exciting things that people are doing out there in the PGA world. Yeah, I know for me, the most exciting part about that show is um, is really getting a chance to meet people. Um, mm -hmm. it's, there's so much to see that it's almost overwhelming. But uh, the opportunity to meet other instructors, to meet people in the business, and to get to know them, introduce yourself, say hi, uh, network a little bit, um, I think is the best thing about the show. And then, And then the other thing that I really like is when they have uh, seminars or, um, or they'll do demonstrations with uh, instructors or with other PGA professionals who will talk about, um, you know, how they teach and things like that. And I'm always interested in that. That's a big reason why I have this show. Uh, me as well. Um, <clears throat> this year, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm fighting a little cold here. Uh, I got a chance to uh, reconnect with Steve Amick, who uh, teaches at Glen Eagles and had a nice conversation with him. Uh, got a chance to meet Jim McLean, uh, who I've never met before. Um, we talked a little bit about his slot trainer um, that he had de developed for Eyeline Golf. So you know, it's kind of interesting when you're at these places and you see you see these big timers and you and you have a common thread with them and they treat you uh, as an equal. Um, and value your opinion and want to learn what you're doing or they see something that you've been doing and they say well I follow you on Twitter and uh, or I follow you on Instagram and you know wow you're really doing some good things with your students let's talk about that that means a lot to me uh, in particular and really validates me as an instructor yeah I, I agree with that I think that um, to all the ones that that I've run into have have just been normal people and uh, they act like normal, normal folk. And I think they are normal folk. I think that most of them, um, you know, they're, they're just have, have a lot of exposure. So we, I want to say the public looks at them as, as stars. Um, and usually the ones who are stars really aren't, aren't that way. They're, they're usually just down, down to earth people who just want to be treated as such. Well, I think that's an interesting point. Um, I know in my own business, we we just opened up another academy, and I've been looking for other instructors, and I'm getting a team together. And I think one of the most critical things that I can uh, put into to play with my instructors is is that they develop relationships with people. It's as a golf instructor, you want to gain people's trust, uh, and you want honest people. You want people with integrity and with character. Um, and I found that the majority of the people that I've met, Martin Hall, Mike Breed, Hank Haney, um, you know, some of the bigs, uh, that are, they're just very genuine people. They're willing to share their experience. Um, Megan Padua is another one, Nicole Weller. They're all people that I can contact um, openly, and they're willing to help you, help you with your business, help you with your instruction, answer questions. Um, I just sent a text the other day to Andrew Rice. 
uh, you know, who would, a lot of people would never even approach, but he's incredibly approachable and to the point of where I can text him or email him or call him and just ask questions about TrackMan, just things that I may not understand um, because he's, he's an expert in that field and I want to continue to learn. Um, so I had a question for him about spin axis and how this affected a shot of one of my students and then his responses were all questions which pushed me to research harder and learn. Uh, so I thought that was a really interesting way to, instead of just saying, hey, this is how you do it and, and uh, kind of brush me off, they challenged me, which I thought was awesome. So, and I'm the same way with people. Uh, I've taken interns, uh, I have a couple of young instructors uh, now on board and they're looking to be mentored. So they come in, they watch lessons and uh, we talk, we watch video, and because I think I owe that to them to, because people have done that for me in my business and my, my teaching experience. Well, I think too that um, in order to grow the game as instructors, um, I believe that uh, it's our duty to um, do as much as we can for each other and help each other in any way. Um, because what that's going to do is that's all going to make us better at what we do. That's going to rise the level of what we do and give us the opportunity to help other people play better, which is just going to grow the game. And because when people enjoy the game, they're going to have a lot more fun and they're going to want to do it. And they're going to, it's, and then it becomes infectious and they want to tell it, tell other people about it. And, oh my gosh, you got to go out and play golf with me and, Absolutely. and things like that. So, so I think that that's really, um, whether they're up-and-coming instructors or whether they're seasoned instructors like ourselves or whether they're expert or I want to say close to expert um, with, with the big boys, uh, you know, the Butch Harmons, the Hank Haney's, the mm -hmm. guys who are working with tour players on a, you know, on a pretty much a regular basis, the David Ledbetters. Um, mm -hmm. Those are, you know, if we can just converse and talk to all of them, um, and, and share our knowledge because really when you think about it, there's just so many darn people out there who want to learn golf that there's more than enough pie to go around for everybody. I, I totally agree with that. It's, it's very interesting what, what I'm doing in my area. I live up in Rochester, New York, so we're very, very steeped in tradition in golf. We have Oak Hill, the Country Club of Rochester, Locust Hill, where the ladies played for a number of years among many other private clubs, many other upscale publics, uh, mid-range publics, <laughs> links to help courses, you know, uh, three municipal golf courses in the area. So there's a lot of competition for golf, um, but there's very little competition for instruction. I mean, Craig Harmon just retired here. We have a number of great instructors in our area, but uh, there's only three or four of us that are really making a living at it. And um, it's interesting. I had a question asked a number of years ago um, uh, through Hank Haney Pro. They were doing a, a feature on uh, my instructional business, and I said nobody's flocking to the Northeast, you know, to be an instructor. That's why I stay, um, and I love the people. I love their work ethic. I love that they're um, open to learning, uh, and you can develop relationships with these people, and, and you know how they move because you grew up in this area. Um, so to me, the ideal job is not going to Florida or Texas or Arizona. It's staying right where I'm at and building from there and then, you know, traveling and going to the PGA show or going to watch other teachers teach in, at their home course, you know, or, or in their digs and uh, learning from them and then taking back possibly what they do into my business, into my repertoire and, and making myself better and my staff better. So we're We've got a facility now on the east side of the city and a facility on the west side of the city. So it's making it very accessible for our students that don't have to travel now 40 minutes to come to us for a lesson. Even though they were, they can come two minutes for a lesson and the people that are on the west side don't have to travel east. They can stay west. And So it's never been done in our area. So it's kind of a, a neat concept. Nice, nice. So at this time of the year, I mean, since you're in the Northeast, and we were yes. just talking before we went on the yeah. air, I know that when I woke up this morning, I'm in Philadelphia, it was two degrees. You were saying mm -hmm. it's like minus 15 where you are. Yeah, yeah we're having a great day. <laughs> <laughs> so It's sunny, though. It's sunny, so that makes everybody happy. Sure. So at this time of the year, um, what are you doing with students and, and – um, 
Uh, do you have stuff set up inside, I would think? And, mm -hmm. and do you encourage your students to work out and to do things through this time of the year uh, since it's off season and there's really not much they can do outside? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, we're just actually starting up the season now. Um, I, I do performance series with my students, which are either three, six, or 12-month series. And then all my youth series are 12 months. Um, at a particular price point for each one. Uh, what it gives them is it gives them four 60-minute lessons a month. Uh, so they're trained to come in at the same time, the same day, you know, every week. Uh, and, and the model is basically you get, you know, 30 to 40 students at that, at that and then you have a very intimate relationship with those students. So with my uh, higher-end players, my college players, uh, mini-tour, anybody like that, we're setting their schedules. Uh, I just sat down Saturday with one of my batter students. He's got 19 tournaments that he's going to play in. Um, so we take a look at which ones are the majors, um, which ones are you know kind of hit and giggles, ones that you can can uh, one that you're earning points for where maybe you don't need to win, or top three or top five, but you can do top 15 because you're just accruing points to get into a major. Um, uh, we just had one student accept a scholarship, so we're preparing him, you know, now for his high school season, which is in the spring here for the boys. Um, and then we have our regular students where they're at all different points. Some are businessmen going to travel, some are businesswomen um, that want to use this uh, business in golf. So we have a facility that's set up that has a putting green in it. Uh, I use TrackMan. Um, so that people can see the numbers and I've got a big 70 inch TV that we project the numbers out to them and, and, uh, we go at it and, and the students are very conditioned to it, which is great. Uh, they show up today. I've got lessons at, uh, I think three o'clock and, you know, I'm there till eight tonight. So we're, you know, our, our lessons and people are happy to come there. And then also I have a strength and conditioning uh, partner as part of my business. So they're also doing functional movement with them uh, the days that they're away from the facility. So either two days a week or three days a week, they do what's called a roots class. It's, um, it's basic movement for golf. And then once they become proficient at that, then they break away and move into individual training. So, it's, so we're pumping out some excellent athletes, excellent businessmen and women. Um, we've got them all the way from six years old all the way up to 72 years so, old right now. And everybody, everybody's getting better. So the ones that you're working with that are more casual players but still want to take lessons, um, is, there, is their schedule as vigorous or do you suggest for them things to do that are as, uh, that are as vigorous as your, as your um, students who are more like trying to play in events and things like that? So, I mean, I know that for me, I don't, Oh, uh, they have a lot less time, so they're not they're what they're working on isn't quite as much. Um, but I still try to get them right. to do stretching and to do um, some type of a fitness regime. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is as rigorous. Um, we treat everybody like a fluid athlete. Everyone's an athlete, a student athlete, um, and we do expect rigor out of them. And and so. With their commitments, <clears throat> we talk a lot about that in, in their commitment. You know, how much time can you commit to a week? Uh, you know, this lesson is just, uh, could be a tune-up one week. It could be a new area. It could be building on another area. It could be another chunk um, of what we're doing. But in the meantime, you know, you have to put in your practice time. And, and they equate it to hitting balls, and I don't. Practice is not hitting balls. It could be working in a mirror. It could be... Um, you know, meditating <laughs> for some sure. people, calming them down, yeah. sports psychiatrist, uh, going in and, and correcting uh, uh, an inconsistency in their body. So it's all inclusive. Um, and the reason I move to these types of things is the one hit, hit lessons, the series of five, uh, the series of three, it just wasn't a relationship to me. Although, you know, I had a number of people that would come back for multiples uh, my idea was that if I'm really going to move people along, there needs to be decisions, there needs to be goal setting, there needs to be a, a deeper process with the people, and there needs to be a commitment on their end that they're going to um, you know, follow through on their end. And if they don't, then just as an instructor would get fired, um, I fire students 
you know, and so far we haven't lost anybody yet. Everybody well, that's quit. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. But that's a great nugget of wisdom that you're giving our listeners is that, you know, if you want to get better at this game, you really do have to make some level of commitment Absolutely. and that you just can't do it and, you know, like go take a few lessons and then expect to get better. Um, a way that I kind of look at that or I try to explain to my students is uh, it's like learning a musical instrument. You don't go and take a piano lesson or a guitar lesson and take five lessons and then expect that you're not going to go back and you can play guitar. Um, and you can go at, at a family party or a gathering or something like that and pick up your instrument and and be okay with playing in front of a good amount of people um, right. and not feel embarrassed or anything like that. So golf is very much like that. It's the same way yeah. um, where you yeah. have to kind of, you know, you got to put a little bit of time into this and, and you got to you gotta give it some, some level of commitment. It doesn't have to be a a high level of commitment, but there, there has to be something going on there. Absolutely. And, and I think there's a uh, misnomer too, that I have some students put a lot of time into it, um, you know, previously to, to meeting me and they're not getting anything out of it. And I said, you know, while the game doesn't really owe you anything, number one, and work doesn't always mean um, that if you're working hard, it doesn't always mean you're working smart, <laughs> which we hear a lot of. Yes. So I said, you have to be practicing the right things we have to have a plan for you and you have to make sure that you're meeting you know your daily goals um we do quite a bit of goal setting with the students i uh came across uh, the big five a few years ago where we look at five people that can impact um the student in their life and then five goals and five decisions that they need to make to meet those goals no matter what they are and then i can start to give them some statistical data based on fairways, greens and regulation, uh, practice putting, penalties, some of the things inside the game, but outside of the game, how are they being influenced to be better each day? Um, and then I use TrackMan, and then I'm also a kinesthetic teacher, so I move students a lot, just like Hank uh, taught, taught his students. You know, uh, it's a hard way to teach, but to me, kinesthetic learning is one of the greatest ways to, to learn. And so we might break a tiny part of the, the uh, equation out of how they're working and just micro-focus on that. And then we'll move to a more global area. We'll move to a bigger area. For example, I might move the club uh, 15 or 20 times perfectly, and then I'll move it the way they move it. And I'll go, how does that feel? They're like, that feels bad. Well, that's you. That was you. Now we're going to do five more perfect and then have them hit a ball, and I can get the desired result. And when they hit that shot, all of a sudden it's intrinsic now they they're engaged and they're starting to feel like they're making progress and they are they're always better when they leave than when they come that's one of our our goals at the academy is to have people be better when they leave and have fun those are really our two two major goals oh sure i mean well that's i think what they're there for um they're there to they're there to to get better and when they get better they have more fun I, I, I think that anybody who uh, does better, is, I mean, it's no fun to struggle. Um, no. <laughs> that, that's for sure. And, and, if, and if it is fun to struggle, then, um, then may, maybe your priorities are a little out of whack. Right. <laughs> At least to the I normal. Switch hands. Basically. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so, so you're very involved with um, eye-lying putting. Yes. And um, so tell us a little bit about your involvement with Eyeline and tell us also um, some of the things that you recommend when it comes to putting. Because I think if you're involved a lot with Eyeline, you're probably, that's one of your, uh, you know, portions of expertise in the game and, and in instruction. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I got involved with Sam Fragat, the owner, probably 10 years ago at a Teach the Teacher with Hank Haney. He spoke. Uh, and he talked about uh, his mantra is getting better at getting better. Uh, and I just thought, wow, that was just, I'd heard it, but never that way before. And he talked a little bit about his life and how he grew up and his story, uh, you know, and, and uh, his children and, and being a parent and everything else. And I just connected with him. He was an, an older gentleman like I am. And, and uh, so we just developed a friendship. And then he would call me and just kind of bounce ideas off me and 
what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And for your listeners, um, I'm also a, a school teacher. So I have taught almost 30 years in the inner city of Rochester, along with having my PGA. So I go from incredible poverty to extreme affluence all you know, within 20 minutes of a day, at the end of a day. And uh, we had connected at that level um, just about uh, the kids and how, how different society is and how much it's changing. So Sam would call me and ask me questions about, what do you think about this training aid? What do you think about that? And, and so I would test it. I'd product test and, and come up with ideas. So we, he came up with the four putting elements, which was um, something that I went through first for the, all the instructors in the country. So he kind of tagged me as the four putting elements expert. Um, and it's stuff that we normally do. It's set up, path, impact, and speed. Um, but it's all kind of a, a neat package where you can get a clinic in a bag, you can get mirrors and rails and the heavy ball and some of the other products that he has. And our friendship just kept developing from there. And, and I consider him just a close friend and also a, very much a mentor uh, in business. And I trust him and um, I, he's loyal. And I know that uh, if I say something to him, it's in confidence, and, and we've shared good times, bad times over the last 10 years as we've lived our lives and our kids have lived their lives, and, and um, so I'm very connected to him. As far as the putting aids that I would recommend, all the stuff that he has really plays on you uh, having a feel so and having sight. So if you're using a mirror, it's being able to see your eyes line up and your shoulders line up and being able to get the club face square. Um, with the rail, it's a feel. It's keeping the heel against the rail and, and keeping that heel on it and moving it back and forth. Putting rods, you know, staying connected. The butter putter, not putting with your hands. And some of the releases this year were fantastic. Uh, Michael Breed's putting sword uh, is awesome. Uh, they redesigned it. Um, change the colors on it, uh, and it's basically, we used to putt, and you're familiar with this, with uh, yardsticks, the steel ones, and they break and splinter and bend, and so this is a bendable uh, rail that you basically, or a sword that you roll up, you can put it in your bag, and if you keep it on the rail or on the sword, um, it's basically mimics a 10-foot putt, so you can putt in your hotel room, you can putt on a green, uh, the, the slot trainer is excellent. <clears throat> you have a template, <clears throat> excuse me, Bernie, a template, and then you can set up different things with it, like a gate drill, or you can set up a release drill or a ball release drill. Um, so it's, there's, it's multiple, multifaceted. So it's, it's always interesting. And then the laser was kind of the hit of the show. Um, I've seen lasers before, used them, and they kind of peter out after about two uses. And there was no place to put it. So Sam designed something that could be put on the shaft of the putter. You can project it at the hole. You can put it on the face of the putter. You can move it out off the toe of the putter. And uh, the the um, optics in it is fantastic. I mean, I don't. you stopped by and, and we were showing clients that you could shine it right up to the ceiling in the, in the Orange County Convention Center there. And people were like, wow, I've never seen a laser that strong. You know, in some countries, it's a weapon. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're very excited about that. And then also he's making a jump now into full swing. So we had the Impact Cube come out this year and uh, some other products, um, balance rods and some other things that, you know, you could use for, for full swing as well. So and we're always busy. We're always talking. And, and I'm trying to design something now. Uh, Steve Amick came out with a great one. Uh, from Glen Eagles called the Bunker Buddy, which, you know, most of the time we would teach with uh, a lie board. Uh, I would have people get a feel, uh, hit a hit their bounce into the lie board, put a pile of sand on it, knock the sand off, and put a ball on the sand and, and hit it off. And Steve's device just basically changed three steps of that. You just, uh, it's amazing, and it's wonderful. Nice, nice. Yeah. Now, uh, as we speak today... Um, and this will be aired in a few weeks. But um, mm -hmm. as we speak today, yesterday, Brant Snedeker won at Pebble. Um, and he has a stroke that's a little bit more old school. Mm -hmm. um, he, I don't know whether he's the one who calls it the pop stroke or whether right. it's 
the media that says he uses a pop stroke right. and then he just kind of goes along with that. Sure. Um, but what do you think of that? I know that he, um, he feels that he can get the ball rolling faster and it can um, stay on line better mm-hmm. uh, and finds the bottom of the cup more easily to him. And that's why he uses it. So, what's your take on that? And do you re- and would you recommend something like that um, to the you know your average weekend warrior? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think you know anything that gets it in the hole in the least amount of strokes to me is is most appropriate. Um, I've got people that have all different si- t- types of putting strokes. Uh, you know, toe up, toe down, face open, face closed, open stance, closed stance, square stance. Uh, big arc, long arc, you know, short, short forward swing. Uh, as long as it's consistent, and I think the pop putting really fits his personality. He's quick, you know. He plays fast. I mean, if everybody played as fast as he does, we, it would be phenomenal. Um, so I think it fits his personality, and I think in his mind, you know, whatever gets him, gets it online, gets it rolling. All right, technical difficulties abound in this episode for some reason. <laughs> Must be the cold. That's so, right. Um, <laughs> next, interviews, next interviews is summertime. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll so, come in. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, there's not much that you can do about technical difficulties. You just got to roll with them. And, it's, okay. and, and to translate that into golf, sometimes that happens there too. So oh, yeah. you just got to roll with the punches and just keep going and – and don't stop. So, so we're just about finishing up here as uh, we're running out of time. But um, I'd like to thank you again, Brian, for being on the show. So a few things that I would like you to let our audience in on is if they're in the New York area or if they want to fly in and do some work with you. I know that you like to do things on a year, you know, like a year round type thing. But if there's some who just want to come in and pick your brain or get some information or maybe – um, do some things from afar with you. What is the best way for them to get in touch with you and uh, and to converse with you? Well, I do. I actually do a lot of one-on-one golf schools. I'll have uh, regular students come in from Dubai and Italy and Sweden and France. Uh, so flying in from Philly or driving in would be no problem. Uh, but they can get in touch with me at my website at www.brianjacobsgolf.com. And they can just use the contact form and I will get back to them well within 24 hours and get the process rolling. Great. That's wonderful. So, Brian, thank you for all the wisdom that you've bestowed upon us today. It's uh, greatly appreciated, and you're a fine gentleman. I've been very, very pleased um, and feel privileged um, to get to know you uh, personally. It's been, um, and hopefully we'll be able to do some things in the future together. Absolutely, Bernie. Thank you so much. It, I uh, just respect you uh, to the end of the earth. Uh, it's just great meeting you face to face at the show. And and uh, anytime you need a guest or need help, just give me a shout. And I'm happy to help out your listeners and happy to help you out as well. It's it's an absolute pleasure. It would be a joy to do anything with you, Brian. You're a great guy. So mm-hmm. until we meet again, what we always like to say here to wrap up is try to keep it in the short grass. Okay. I'll see you next time. All right. Take care.